So you guys are the hardcore early birds who think getting up at 9 in the morning is a, is a good I character, and character building idea, I guess. Do you want me to get started? All right. Good. Say that again? Oh, exactly. Well, I'm from, it's from Sweden, so it's <laughs> already late into the afternoon here. So. so welcome back to our, our third and final cosmology lecture. Let's start by just very briefly summarizing what we've done so far. We have, st we have looked at, um, first of all, what we can say about our expanding universe that we inhabit if we ignore the perturbations to it. We've talked about them a fair bit already, in a little bit peripherally, but not derived anything about them. We've said, suppose you just set the density to be uniform, depending only on time, not on space. And same thing for all other properties. Then, what happens? Well, we found we can solve the Friedman equation and, and calculate how our universe will expand as a function of time. And from that, in turn, we can calculate everything that we can measure and relate it to fundamental parameters in the theory, like how much dark matter there is, how much dark energy there is, etc., etc. And what we've learned so far about the expansion history of our universe is all summarized conveniently in, in this one figure, which shows how dense our universe has been as a function of time, or, or I'm using this time variable here, the expansion, the size of it, A on a log scale. Well, if you prefer redshift, the log of the, red, you know, the 1 plus the redshift is just the inverse of this. So we have redshift 0 going up to redshift of 10, of 10 to the 20, 10 to the 40 redshift, 10 to the 60 redshift. And what we see is that kind of in the recent past, our universe's density has been dropping like a to the minus 3. It's been dominated by just stuff, m matter, Bar baryonic and dark. But more recently, the density has been diluting slower and slower and slower because there's some other kind of substance, dark energy, which doesn't seem to be diluting at all. A lot of interest in figuring out more about what's happening here to learn about this dark energy. As we go to the past, our universe diluted even faster because it was dominated by relativistic particles like photons, neutrinos, and generally fast-moving stuff things dilute at like the fourth power of the density. But we think, or at least a lot of people think, that the most popular idea of what happened early on is that it's even more interesting because in the distant past, there was another period where the stuff in the universe didn't dilute much. We had some sort of inflation going, and the total curve lo looks something like this. And, and in the question and answer session yesterday, many of you asked me in both of the rooms we were a lot about this. and the single biggest sensation which might happen in cosmology if we get lucky in the next few years is that you'll see on the front page of the New York Times that we have detected gravitational waves that were produced during this epoch. If that happens, then we can push back what we know, the frontier of our knowledge from the first second or so to the first, to about 10 to the minus 34 seconds after a big bang. And we can start talking confidently about physics, not just uh, the energy scale of nuclear physics, which is what was relevant when, when the universe was, our universe was one second old, but at the gut scale, which would be just fantastic. It's a wonderful marriage of particle physics and cosmology. And, and w of course, one of the reasons that the organizers invited me to, have, to be here with you to talk about cosmology at a particle physics conference is because our universe provides the most powerful particle accelerator we have. And, and it's a wonderful physics lab where we don't even have, you know, the fun, it's already funded. <laughs> we just need to look at it carefully to see what, what these wonderful experiments are producing. And um, this, I think it's going to be very exciting to see how this plot looks in a few years when we, when we learn more about it. Before we just start perturbing things more carefully and go to first order, one, I want to give you one last slide about the zeroth order. If you have a universe which is homogeneous, where nothing depends on position. There's still some more interesting things to say about it, in addition to the expansion history. First of all, you can talk about how curved it is, and we've already done that, and the curvature parameter, and it's 
convection systems with having no curvature at all. Second, there's topology. Euclid said space goes on forever, but we now know it's perfectly fine mathematically to define a space which is flat and doesn't go on forever. You can have make a torus where you, where you just say, okay, let's take a piece of paper folded like this. This, for example, is an example of a space which is flat. The angles of any triangle you draw here add up to 180 degrees, yet it's not infinite in this direction. If you go really far that way, you'll, you'll come back from the other side. Our universe, in principle, could be that way. It could even be that way, you know, that you go in, off in any direction, you come back from the other side. Mathematicians have classified these sort of topological options in great detail. And, string th and of course, in string theory, we look at this all the time, and we say, actually, maybe the re actual space we live in has nine dimensions, but six of them are curled up with a funny topology. So you might say, actually, maybe what was going on is all nine, actually, were curled up with a small topology. That's a Calabiao manifold. And then three of the dimensions inflated and stretched out and got really big. And they're the ones we call space. So it's perfectly reasonable to look experimentally to see if there's any evidence that space connects back on itself. And there's been a lot of nice measurements and studies. You can look over there and see, do I see the back of my own head? No. Um, but you know, it's hard to know if you're seeing the back of your own head 10 billion light years away, because Earth didn't even exist that long ago. So you can look and ask maybe, can I see the same quasar over there? 10 billion light years away and there. People have looked for these sort of things. Right now, the most sensitive test people have done is looking at the cosmic micro background itself to see if there's some part over there that matches the, the part over there. And right now, the total net summary of maybe 100 papers about this in the literature, some of which I've even been involved with myself, is that we haven't found any evidence at all to support this. So we can put a lower bound, at least, on, on, on the size of any funny topology. So right now, plain vanilla space, actually just flat space like Euclid envisioned except expanding fits all the data. All right, let's perturb our universe. We look back and, then, and, and take pictures of what our baby universe look, was like. We see these 10 to minus 5 level fluctuations we talked about. Now we see them even more crisply with Planck. Right? And um, if you went back and instead, at that epoch, just made a regular plot on a linear scale of the density, it would look very boring, like this. Like one of those joke pictures, boulder by night or boulder in the fog or whatever. Totally uniform, because the fluctuations would only be about 10 to the minus 5. But if you, if you wait long enough, these, these, as we talked about, these fluctuations get amplified get bigger and bigger in amplitude until they grow into the galaxies and large scale structure that we see around us today. Okay? So what we want to understand now is a bit more quantitatively, how does this happen? I mentioned in the first lecture qualitatively why it happens. If you have something uniform, then put a little bit of extra stuff here. The gravitational attraction from that is going to draw in more stuff, make more stuff fall into it. You get a bigger clump, gets a bigger clump, a bigger clump, and eventually something really cool might happen like a galaxy. But how can we understand that a little bit more clearly? The full-on treatment of this, I, I could give a, probably about a series of, say, 10 lectures of this. It's a beautiful subject and, and very complex. But uh, I want to give you a little flavor of it. So, so I want to do two things. First, let me just show you some extremely basic things to, get, to provide you a really solid intuition for, for, um, some of the, for the single most important ideas. And then I want to show you a series of animations of what actually happens when you do the full numerical calculations. Okay? So you can get a bit of an appreciation for them, for, the, for how fun this is. Oh, that's the fixed one. This one. Good. So suppose, let's begin with a very sim the simplest possible kind of substance that you could clump. Suppose we just model this, this business here as a bunch of particles, dark matter particles, whatever, atoms, and uh, 
just or some kind of matter, okay? And we say this matter has some sort of density. The density is a function of position, time. Okay? It also has a velocity at every position and time. And it has, of course, because of that, some gravitational, Newtonian gravitational potential. Okay? And let's analyze how is that going to evolve. This is called Newtonian perturbation theory. And the first really awesome analysis of this was done by genes, actually, over 100 years ago. Then you can generalize, generalize it to relativistic perturbation theory by adding in particles moving at the speed of light and adding in event horizons and stuff like this. But what we're going to do now is this ordinary matter, and the only assumption we have to make is that the part of the space we're looking at is still significantly smaller, this box, than... than, than um, say, 13, 10 billion light years. So we don't have to worry too much about event horizons and, st and stuff like this. So what equations govern these things? Well, this is this classic fluid dynamics. First, we have this continuity equation, which just, tell, just tells us that mass is conserved. So if, I, if there is some kind of divergence of the stuff, then that must, there must be a change in the density to offset that. So the total amount of mass doesn't change. Continuity equation. Then we need some kind of law of motion, just Newton's laws, F equals ma is you know, acting on every little piece of stuff, right? So if there's, if there's a gravitational gradient or a pressure gradient, it'll start accelerating the stuff in the corresponding direction. The equation for that looks like this. V dot plus V dot delta equals minus whatever the force is on this little element. So it's the gradient of the gravitational potential gives a gravitational force. And then uh, there's a pressure gradient. It comes in and matters. And this is called the Euler equation. And finally, we have the Poisson equation of gravity that just says that if you know the density field and you want to know what the gravitational potential of phi is, then just solve this equation. Okay? So these three equations are all we need to solve, these three linear partial differential equations, to figure out what's going to happen. And this is typically something I'll give as a homework assignment when I teach a cosmology course. It takes a fair number of pages to do it, so I'll skip over the details and just cut to the chase. The first thing that you find is that, that uh, the zeroth order, we're gonna, we do again perturbation theory, ignore, let's ignore the fluctuations and just say, assume that all, all of these quantities here are independent of position, velocity, and the density don't depend on position, then you get, yeah? Oh, wait, did I, did I drop a term? Oh, 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 of course. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I, I dropped, uh, <laughs> I, I just dropped one symbol. Of course, it's, there's a V here. Exactly. This is the, if it just said this, you would think this is like, V dot, like an acceleration. But it's, you have a, you're looking at the co-moving fluid element, so if things are moving, you get this extra little term here. This is what it should look like. Thank you so much for catching that. So it's such a treat to lecture to people who are on the ball. Okay? If, you just, if you assume the density doesn't depend on position, you get this zeroth order solution, show right here. which is that the density itself, I'm going to put subscript zero because it's the zeroth order solution, as a function of position and, t and space, you know, by assumption doesn't depend at all on, on, on uh, position. So it's just some function of time. And in fact, 
I may call that rho bar. You can think of it as the average density. And because mass is conserved, without even solving those equations, it, it's obvious that it has to be diluting like a to the minus 3. If, if the whole, our universe is expanding, it's going to be a over a naught to minus 3. And then, not surprisingly, I, and, and then what you also find is, is that the velocity vector is a function of position in space equals a dot divided by a times the position vector, which is exactly Hubble's law, which we already derived when we solved the Friedman equation. So, so what you see here is, is the first kind of funny thing is when you just take these equations, which just are standard classical physics, you already get actually the Friedman equation popping out. And this is a sort of stunning fact that you can actually derive the whole Friedman equation of the expanding universe without general relativity, just from classical mechanics. Which is, a, if you're interested, if you're hardcore relativity buffs, it has to do with Birkhoff's theorem. You, know, you remember in general relativity, if it's a spherically symmetric thing, you can ignore what's outside of a sphere. And it, it turns out that um, you just recover these nice classical things. But let's do the interesting th thing now and go to, and go to first order. Oh, no, no. And I just put a, I just wrote rho bar here because I don't want to confuse. This, this symbol is a, the density is a something which depends also on position. We have these perturbations, right? If you look at the picture I have here, this is a function not just of time, but also of space. And then I wrote rho bar as a position independent thing, which we're going to be thinking as the average, of a, thinking of as the average density. So, we sometimes use bars for vectors, but we also sometimes use bars in statistics for average or mean. So this is the mean density. If you look at this picture, suppose you just ask, what's the average number of cubics? What's the average number of kilograms per cubic, cubic light year or whatever? That's rho bar. Okay. Now, let's go look at. Look, let's go to first order. So at the first order, let's define first of all our notation. So rho bar is the mean density. Let's take our full density, rho, which depends on position and time, and write it as this zeroth order thing, rho bar zero, which just depends on time, times 1 plus a small correction, which we're going to call lowercase delta, not to be confused with the delta fun direct delta function, which depends on both position and time. Okay? This quantity we usually call the density fluctuation. And it's kind of convenient to have it be dimensionless. You can think of delta as basically telling you how many percent more how many percent more stuff than average do you have in any one region? So if you look here at the, at the, at the um, picture, there, for example, delta is positive because there's more stuff more in this region of space than average. Here, delta is negative. Okay? And early on, delta is much, much less than 1. And it's, in fact, about at the level of 10 to the minus 5. Well, gradually, delta is going to grow and become of order unity and bigger in some places. So let, let's see how it grows. When you do a, do a few pages of algebra, you, you plug in this and in the corresponding perturbed quantities of for v and phi into, into here. The same thing happens, it always happens when you do linear perturbation theory. Right? You, you plug everything in and, and expand everything by, by order, so by how many powers of, of delta you have. And then all the zeroth order terms always cancel out in the equations. That was an equal sign here. And then all the second order terms and cubic terms, or whatever, you throw away. <coughs> 
because we're going to... And then you keep only the, the linear terms, and you get linear partial differential equations. And uh, as I mentioned in my first talk, the, now that you have these linear partial differential equations, you, you can go ahead and Fourier transform everything in sight, because since the, the zeroth order solution was independent of position, it's wonderful to Fourier transform stuff. Then all the derivatives that you have, all the spatial derivatives, just become powers of k. And you actually get something very simple. And in the end, you, you get a very nice equation, which, which, is, which is just an ordinary differential equation now, which tells you how any given Fourier mode, rho hat of k, will evolve with respect to time. And the equation looks like this. It's a second order equation, much like a harmonic oscillator equation, with a second derivative plus twice the Hubble parameter times the first derivative plus a little parenthesis the sound speed squared, which comes in from the, from the pressure here, the derivative of the pressure, times k squared over the scale factor squared, minus 4 pi g rho bar, the mean density, times delta half of k. This whole thing equals 0. Okay. This equation, which is very famous, is sometimes called the genes equation in honor of genes. He didn't solve it for an expanding universe, but if you just take a equals 1 so, and rho equals constant, so, not, so the universe isn't expanding, that's the version the genes derived. Okay? Now what does this tell us? This is a very interesting equation. Suppose, first of all, we do what genes did and say, we just have some stuff, put some gas in this box, consider the air in this room, for example. It obeys exactly this because the, as I'm not speaking very loudly, the density fluctuations are much less than 1. So, we, so rho is now this, the constant air density. Let's take A equals 1. What is this saying? Well, this is very much like a harmonic. And if the room isn't expanding, if the air isn't expanding, that means this H drops out also. So this is just like a harmonic oscillator equation, right? Where this thing here, tells us the frequency of oscillation. And as long as this term wins over this term, then we get this whole thing being positive. You see, it's just like a harmonic oscillator. Whenever, whenever some, when, if this delta gets, is positive, then the second derivative gets negative. There's a restoring force, and vice versa. So if you make the density a little bit higher here in this part of space than elsewhere, It'll oscillate. Sound waves. This is exactly why you can hear me. Right? Suppose now, though, just for kicks, we make the room really, really big, like billions of light years in size. Okay? Now we can start looking at, at wavelengths, k, of perturbation, which are very, very long wavelengths, like billions of light years, which makes this k extremely small. And eventually, this term will now be, become smaller than that term. So now the, the whole, this is, this thing would norm, if you think about this as the frequency squared of your oscillation, this becomes negative. Right? Can someone tell me what, what happened, what does that mean? If you take a harmonic oscillator potential and you change the sign so that it's like an upside down harmonic oscillator, what, what does that physically mean? Say that a little bit louder. A runaway solution, exactly, you get an instability where the solutions are not sines and cosines anymore, but they're growing and decaying exponentials. And there's a growing exponential solution. Instability. So what genes showed is that there's a magic, always a magic scale k, right? Gene scale k genes, which corresponds to, which is the magic scale we get if we set this equal to zero, which is just, so we can, so a, Sorry, so k over a equals just 4 pi g rho square root over the sound speed. So k, we define this. And then if you have a, any scale bigger than the gene scale, in other words, with a smaller wave number, it'll be unstable. So how do we think about this? There's always a tug, a tug of war between two forces. Gravity is trying to squish the air in this room and make it collapse into a black hole, ultimately. 
And the pressure is saying, ah, ah, and pushing back, okay? Who wins? Depends on the wavelength. For small scale fluctuations, the pressure always wins. But if, it's, if you have a large enough fluctuation, gravity always wins. Big enough, gravity always wins. Our universe has, is full of hydrogen gas, right? It has a pressure. So what you should expect in the universe is that below a certain scale, everything was stable. But above a certain scale, you would have an instability and things would start to cluster and clump. This is exactly what happens. So let's look now <coughs> on large scales, on large scales, So where the wave number k is much less than the genes scale. Again, the l wavelength lambda is just one over, goes like just 2 pi over the, the wave number k, right? Then we can ignore this term here. Now there's no longer any k dependence at all in my equation, so I can undo the whole Fourier transform, go back to real space, and I just get now, you know, delta double dot I can, in, in real space plus... 2h delta dot minus 4 pi g rho delta equals 0. Um, wh one more thing. We talked about air in this room. Notice, uh, and we said that on very large scales you get an exponential growth. Uh, but in, more generally, if the universe is expanding, this term shows up, right? h. And it's positive. If, you, if this were a harmonic oscillator, so this said, you know, x double dot acceleration, this would be the velocity, right? What would we call this term? D drag or friction. So the expanding universe causes a kind of friction term. What this ends up doing when you solve the equations is it, it moderates the instability a little bit. It doesn't re remove the instability, but it changes it from being an exponential runaway to a, just a a linear runaway. And what you actually get is a growing mode in unstable solution, which is extremely simple. Delta is just proportional to A. So every time our universe gets 10 times bigger, it also gets 10 times clumpier. So more specifically, this fun the fluctuation is a function of position and, and, and scale factor, right? or time, just goes like whatever it was, and it equals whatever this was initially, times however much the universe is grown by. Right? This is a super simple equation, very, very useful to remember. So let's just draw a picture of what this entails. If this is scale factor A, and this is today, one. Make it a little bit shorter. And here is 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4. This is, ten, this is redshift of 1,000. Right? The universe was 1,000 times smaller. What this solution says is that as long as the density of our universe is dominated by matter, it will keep getting clumpier and clumpier. When did that happen? Well, early on we were dominated by, by radiation instead. And when you repeat the calculation then, actually it turns out you don't get any fluctuation growth. The gene scale, but if, if, you, if you have, if you go back to redshift of 10,000, for example, then the energy density of the universe is dominated by stuff like photons. They're always flying around at the speed of light. The sound speed comes out to be the speed of light divided by root 3, because the photons spend one third of the time going in each direction. That's where the 3 comes from. So ball ballpark speed of light sound speed. And when you work out what the gene scale is, it turns out to always be equal to this, basically the scale of the whole horizon. So you can't get anything within the horizon to go unstable. If you go above the horizon, you need to generalize this to general relativity. But things outside the horizon are in causal, causal, not in causal contact, and they, there's no instability there either. So basically, for the longest time, if this is the amplitude of fluctuations delta, they don't grow. They stay basically constant. Maybe they oscillate a little bit. 
like a sound wave. But by about redshift 3000, the photons have diluted enough that the density starts to be dominated by matter. That presses the start button on this instability. And we start picking up now this linear growth. I won't draw this quite as a 45 degree angle because then I'm going to hit my equations. <laughs> but this is supposed to be 45 degrees, delta proportional to A, OK? Until we ha something else happens, which again just ends the period of matter domination. This is matter, matter dominated period. And what is that? What happens recently that makes the universe not being dominated by matter anymore, violating this solution? A little bit louder, please. Dark energy kicks in, exactly. And then ew, fluctuations again start, stop growing. So this is the basic story of what happens. To do with the full calculation, it's even more complicated because all along you also have other stuff here. You have neutrinos floating around and, and so on. There are really multiple components and you do the perturbation separately for each of them. And they talk to each other, they couple through gravity, and sometimes they also couple by colliding with each other. But this basic solution is by far the most important mechanism going on. And let's talk now about what actually happens when you do the full Monte Carlo calculation to get a little bit of, of insight in this. Yes? Uh, that isn't, this doesn't tell you anything about whether it should be isotropic or not. This is just so far saying if you start with some initial conditions, this is how they will evolve. Right? Inflation itself produces a very homogeneous and isotropic initial condition. That's one of the reasons people love inflation so much. So if inflation happened by the time it's done, you have something super uniform, okay? but not completely uniform. In fact, since you asked, you give me an opportunity to talk about what I think is arguably the single most beautiful idea I've ever heard in all of physics, which is where these fluctuations come from. You know, what inflation says is that the origin of, of the galaxies, these fluctuations, are quantum fluctuations, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You know, and when you first hear about this, you're like, what? That's ridiculous. Quantum fluctuations are supposed to be important on, on atomic scales. 10 to the minus 10 meters, not 10 to the 20 meters. But the beautiful thing is that during inflation, these quantum fluctuations are indeed Im important and imprinted on these ridiculously small scales. But then space itself stretched, is stretched out by inflation, by a ridiculous factor. So these super short wavelengths become these huge wavelengths of, billion, of billions of light years. And the, and the quantum fluctuations that inflation put there are, of course, still there. They're, all wavelengths of everything are just stretched. And then gravity gets to work now in destabilizing things and amplifying them. So inflation produces the initial conditions that you asked about. Uniform, which is almost perfectly homogeneous and isotropic, with tiny fluctuations. And then what I've shown you here is simply how good old gravity comes in and just acts as an amplifier. and amplifies these fluctuations. Does that help? Good. So, how do we measure this stuff? In, in get, I, we talked a lot about precision measurements. Well, it turns out that the most interesting, beca because this is a, a process which is statistically homogeneous, if you measure, for example, the co two point correlation function between two different places, The answer will only depend on, won't depend on where you put them, only on how far apart they are. And it won't depend on how things are rotated either. So the key thing that you want to measure is actually just the two-point correlation function, which is a function of one variable here. Or, which turns out to be even more convenient, the Fourier transform of that, of that function, which you call the power spectrum. So specifically what you can imagine doing is you take this density field, imagine you just have the density as a function of, three, of x, y, and z in a big cube, just Fourier transform the whole thing. And you just look at the variance of that. That's the power spectrum. 
And that variance will be independent of any rotations you make. It will depend only on the length of the k vector, not on its direction. And when you plot that, this is what it looks like. A curve that rises and then falls like this. And here you see also measurements of it done with five different techniques, which I'll tell you about now, one at a time. Okay? And uh, I haven't shown you the theory curve yet on top of this, but the remarkable thing is that the theory curve actually, from these, when you take the prediction of what the power spectrum was that came out of inflation, and then plug in the amplification by these kind of processes, goes right through all of this. Question. Yeah. Yes. So, well, yes and no. So, so if, um, if once you have scales, K, if K is much smaller than the gene scale, if you have very long wavelength, then they all get amplified by the same factor, and their K stops to matter. So you might ask, why is there a bend in this curve? If, if I just said that K doesn't matter? Why isn't this just some kind of... Inflation produces this power law. So if you amplify a power law in a K-independent way, presumably you should still have a power law, but you don't. You have a power law here and a different power law there, right? So why is that there, that bend there? That has to do... That bend actually comes from the fact that there's a bend in this curve here. Because the fluctuations that were all produced during inflation, they come back into the horizon and start growing at different times. And the ones that came in just long back here, before our universe was able to grow its perturbations, they just sat there and wasted time and oscillated. And all started growing at the same time around the range of 3,000. But the fluctuations that were very long wavelengths that were, were made that entered the horizon recently, they, they could start growing as soon as they entered the horizon because we were already matter-dominated. <laughs> and that's ultimately the origin of this. So, so when you work through the math carefully, what you find is that the wavelength scale of that bend in the power spectrum, that K, that corresponds exactly to matter radiation equality, to the, the, to the, the size of our universe, the co-moving size of our universe at the rate of 3,000. I'm glad you asked this. So let's look a little bit now at these different kinds of data, okay? And then we'll come back and come back and talk a bit more about the physics of how, of how these things work. So I have five different kinds of measurements here. Let's start with the most straightforward kind, the, black, the, the, the green ones, galaxy clustering, where you simply look at all the galaxies in 3D and you can do these Fourier transforms. So there's a lot, a lot more work to it than that. But, but um, in the beginning, this was a complete mess. First time, so this is a compilation that my friend Michael Vogel gave to me in 1999 of all measurements of this power spectrum from galaxy surveys. And you can see, I asked him, Michael, why didn't you put error bars on this plot? And he's like, because I didn't believe them. And you see, some, some measurements claim to be 10 times or bigger than other measurements on the same scale. It's a total mess. Then gradually, galaxy surveys got bigger and much more precise, and people started, I, many people, I was myself included, worked very hard on, on um, coming up with methods of, of figuring out, measuring the power spectrum more carefully, taking into account all kind of complications. You can't just Fourier transform something with it if, if the survey sampling is very incomplete and, and the, the galaxies are sort of biased traces of the mass and, and whatnot. And th this is the first measurement that I really... Th this is, some, this is the, actually the paper that took me the longest time ever to write. I worked six years on it with my friends in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. But this was also the first paper where I actually believed the error bars on the power spectrum. And um, another thing you can do is you can look at galaxy clusters. You can, you can look at the biggest clumps in our universe. It's these clumps of tens or hundreds of millions of galaxies, uh, sorry, tens or hundreds or even thousands of galaxies, and just count how many are there different redshifts. That turns out to be a good measure of, of this. A third thing you can do is you can take the microwave background power spectrum from Planck, say, and you can transform it into this space and plot it here. And what you see, it agrees beautifully with what we, uh, pre, uh, what we had earlier inferred from, from galaxy surveys. But it also extends out and lets you measure things on super large scales. So here, 
you have the, this scale on the left is the largest, these are the largest scales. This is basically the wavelength of our universe, this, this, the scale of our universe. Let me scroll this down a bit. We don't have any galaxy surveys that have mapped the whole volume of our universe. So, so by galaxy clustering studies, we can only go to about a hundred, you know, a gigap maybe a billion light years or something. Micro background measures out here. Let's talk a little bit more about the micro background. So we're taking photos of the inside of this plasma sphere that we discussed. Yeah? It doesn't. Yeah, so, so, the, so a fair amount of physics has to go in to, to compare these two. Uh, no, here, the, let me tell you a bit more about the measurement we do here, and I think this will become more clear. So we take pictures of the micro background like this. We're photographing the inside of this sphere. Okay. First of all, let's just understand why are there any fluctuations at all in the micro background? After all, you know, we're photographing this, this plasma. We're photographing this, this hot plasma, which has the, whatever temperature it has to have to stop being a plasma and go neutral, right? You do the math, it happens at about 3,000 Kelvin. As you gradually cool this off, it becomes neutral. So we're taking a picture of a 3,000 Kelvin thing at redshift of about 1,000. Why doesn't, it should look 3 Kelvin everywhere, shouldn't it? If the temperature really is 3 Kelvin everywhere, the power spectrum should be exactly zero because, you know, the, the fluctuations. There's no fluctuations. So, so why does it actually look hotter in some places and colder in some places then? Well, it's actually because of a combination of three separate effects, each of which is actually quite easy to understand. First of all, we know that there are these density fluctuations back in, even in this, back then at redshift of 1,000 in this plasma wall, right? Small ones, 10 to minus 5 level, but still. Now, if you have, if you have, photons, just a bunch of black body photons, how does their density depend on temperature? Does it remind me of that? T to the fourth, exactly. That means in places where it's a little bit denser that it's going to be a little bit hotter. I've written an equation here where you see that the density fluctuation, the temperature fluctuation we see if we look in a given direction, given by the unit vector r, the sum of three things. The third term is, has to do with the one you just set here. When it's a bit denser, it will look a bit hotter there. Okay? The second thing that happens is, if there's a little bit more, suppose this is the micro background, the, this plasma surface of last scanning. If there is an over dense blob, if the density here is a bit higher than it is elsewhere, then the, the gravitational potential is going to be kind of lower. You have a gravitational potential well, right? And that's going to give you a gravitational redshift. So when these microwave background photons have to climb out of there to fly to you, what happens to them? Will they suffer a redshift or a blue shift? A redshift. Will that make them look hotter or colder to you? Colder. So here you have another effect now. The first term, the gravitational potential enters back at the redshift of 1,000. And this term actually partially cancels the first term because we, we agreed that if there's more stuff here, density is higher, so it's going to look intrinsically hotter. But then when the photons try to leave, they get redshifted, which makes them look colder. Okay? And then there's a third effect also. Because you have these clump, this cl slight clumpiness that's formed, the stuff must have moved a little bit to make these clumps. So there must be some velocities. Suppose this little clump of plasma that you're photographing in, with Planck, the Planck satellite in this direction is moving a little bit towards you. Is that going to give you a Doppler redshift or Doppler blue shift? Blue shift. Will that make it look hotter or colder? Make it look hotter. So that's this middle term. You also get the, the dot product of the velocity with the line of sight direction. All of these three terms, when you work them out, turn out to be about 10 to minus 5. They have, and they combine and give you, therefore, a power. So you expect to see fluctuations at the 10 to minus 5 level. And you're quite right. These photons, as they fly through you, you know, they're photons. They don't obey the Jeans equation at all. But even if they don't do anything on the way to you, they, there already was imprinted in them this fluctuation. The ones that came from some places were a little bit hotter. Some that came from other places were a little bit colder. And that's 
the main number, the number one thing that we see. Okay? There are actually a few additional things that mess with the photons some a little bit along the line of sight, which give some additional effects that you can ask me about later. But the main source of these fluctuations is, are, are just the density fluctuations back there at redshift of 1,000. Now, that's the first thing I want you to understand. Why are there fluctuations? Because of density, because of gravitational redshift, because of Doppler. Why are there wiggles in this power spectrum? Why does the micro background power spectrum look so beautifully complicated? Why is that? Question. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes, it does. That's exactly right. So inflation produces a very boring power spectrum, which is pretty much scale invariant, 10 to the minus 5. And then you have, but then we can do all this physics that we understand much better. Plasma physics, gravitational instability, and see how the universe acts as an amplifier on these. And it's an interesting kind of amplifier. You know, if you have an equalizer on an old boombox, it, it might, you might turn up the treble a little bit more, or the bass a little bit more, or put in a subwoofer. So it amplifies different frequencies by different amounts. Our universe is just like that. That's why the thing that actually we actually measure has these bumps in it now, that some, some wavelengths have been amplified more than others. And that part can be, will ultimately be understood from all this plasma physics and uh, gravity physics. The uh, inflation, all it does is it produces a very flat, boring, straight line, 10 to minus 5 power spectrum to start with. Good. So, yeah? Ah, and be stuck now at 10 to minus 2, which is two orders of magnitude too low. It's a wonderful question. Yes, you might think so. Um, however, w w what, what um, actually, yeah, yeah, there are some other factors which, yeah, this is a very, very good question. Um, when you actually ac ask, how, how, what's the percentage fluctuation in the density in a given volume here? No. What you actually end up doing is you take the Fourier space thing and you do a, and go back into real space and you get a sum of contributions from many different Fourier wave numbers. And that gives you a lot of pi factors and also some other factors which, which end up bringing things up to order one and, and beyond. So it's very important when you're actually going to do the work to be a little more careful with this. But your intuition otherwise would be, would be quite right. And it is true, on the very, if, you, if you go look on the very largest scales in our universe today, if you start looking at the scale of you know, a billion light years, the fluctuations still are quite low, um, more along the lines of what you would intuitively, what you would intuitively guess from that. All right? So let's ask another very basic question. Why are there wiggles in this power spectrum? We just talked about why there should be fluctuations at all, but why should some wavelengths be amplified more than others? Well, let's go back and think about what things were like before redshift of 1,000. We have this hot plasma. We have some sound waves going on there. So if you, look, if you just look at the density at any one place in there, it's going to oscillate like a sound wave, like it's a cosine of time times some frequency, omega, okay? And uh, what, what is this frequency? Well, the frequency of oscillation is always, by definition, equal to the wave number times the sound speed. Okay. And the sound speed, I already told you, is approximately the speed of light back then. It's the speed of light divided by the square root of 3, because the pressure is dominated by photons. Okay. So the density at any point back then is oscillating, like cosine of k, the wave number, times the speed of light, roughly, times c. But we're not measuring this with Planck as a function of time. What we're actually doing is we're taking a snapshot at the particular time t equals 400,000 years. That's when our universe became transparent. Click, click, smile for the camera, smile for Planck. Okay? And then we can now Fourier transform this and look at this now as a function of k for a fixed t. 
So you say, sure enough, now you get a cosine, right? Cosine of a k. You expect something oscillating as a function of scale. That's why they're wiggles. What, what is the scale of the wiggles? Well, it's just the prefactor of, of the multiplies k. 400,000 years times roughly the speed of light, namely 400,000 light years. So you expect the typical wiggle scale to be about 400,000 light years in moving coordinates. And when you do the stuff we did yesterday, and you ask, OK, take 400,000 light years, put it at redshift of 1,000, ask, what angle does that subtend in the sky? What's the, you use the angle diameter distance jazz we, we looked at, right? The answer is about one degree. The characteristic wiggle scale is about one degree here. That's how this all hangs together, OK? And sure enough, when you look at these beautiful measurements, there's a fantastic peak here at about one degree, and then there's another one at about twice that, about three times. This does, does this, raise your hand though if you think this looks exactly like a cosine. <laughs> I don't see any hand, it doesn't of course. That's because there are three terms, not one. In fact, these two, the first and the third I told you sort of partly cancel out, they go kind of like a cosine. The velocity is always out of phase with, with uh, by 90 degrees, so that goes like a sine. If you take sine squared plus cos squared, you get one, you get no oscillations, but these have different amplitudes, so they don't quite cancel out. What you're seeing here is a little bit of a sine squared plus not, a little bit of a cos squared plus a little bit of sine squared. And then moreover, the power spectrum we're measuring is always a square of the fluctuation. So you never see anything negative here. So this is, now we're beginning to, now we can understand a little bit more why it looks like this. And then there are various other complications which explain why it decays down like this on the right side and stuff like that. And, and just to make it, um, to give you a little bit more appreciation, appreciation for how, how um, rich this physics is, let's go back to my website again that we looked at and click on uh, technical, CMB movies, view, zoom out, you can see it. And let's, let's look at the top panel here. I want to just, together with you, show you. We have a lot of different cosmological parameters here. Yesterday we talked about what happens to the theoretical prediction for the power spectrum shown in red as you change the curvature. If you change the curvature of space, it has no impact at all on, on all the physics back at redshift of 1,000 because Omega curvature, whatever it is now, pretty much, was zero, was zero back then. Because right? curvature dilutes, like, scale factor to minus two. And matter dilutes, like, scale, scale factor to minus three. So if you go back a factor of 1,000, the matter becomes 1,000 times more important than the curvature, and you can neglect it. Same thing with the dark energy, completely irrelevant back then. So the only effects of changing the dark energy and the curvature have to do with angle diameter distance and stuff like that. All it's doing is shifting the angle scale, stretching these curves, sh or shifting them left and right. But if you change this parameter, tau, this is what the nerdily called optical depth to reionization. It's the prob that this, this is the probability that a random photon flying from back here to you will not make it, because it'll bounce off of a free electron, which was created by the first stars and, and stuff, ionizing part of the hydrogen. Um, the, the more of that dumb scattering happens, the more you do wash out the fluctuations because the photons didn't make it to you. And then some fraction of the photons that you see didn't come from there. They came from some randomly scattered place and were uniform. That suppressed, that doesn't change the peaks. It sh changes the amplitude of things on small scales. The larger scales can't be washed out. Um, if, you ch if you start changing instead now, um, how much dark matter you have. Look at how complicated that is. The dark matter is the engine of amplification, right? And changes in a very crucial way the heights of these different peaks. If you change how much atoms you have, that also changes the heights of these peaks, but in a very different way. It turns out that the atoms affect the sine and the cosine component differently. And what's so nice about that is that the, the, um, if you look at the ratio, for example, of the height of the first peak the, the, or the second peak to the third peak, that turns out to be very sensitive to, to the, the density of atoms. If you look at, if you like, if you're interested in neutrinos, the fraction they behave differently again. They're flying out around in space. They have mass. 
they're not going at the speed of light, so they can cluster a bit, but they, they won't cluster so much in the beginning when they're going too fast, so the gene scale is too large, they cluster a bit later, and, but they also interpenetrate each other, whereas atom, gas atoms don't. They behave differently. Because of each, of each of these parameters affects this messy curve in a different way, that means if you measure it accurately, you can separately infer all of these parameters. What about inflation? If you just change the 10 to the minus 5 number, but inflation made to 10 to the minus 4 or something else, that's just turning the volume button on your amplifier. It just shifts all the, the whole curve up down. If you change the spectral index of inflation away from scale of energy, that just tilts the whole curve. You took the initial power law and made it sloped, so you multi you're multiplying it by a known amplification. You get a tilt out. If you put in uh, these gravi if you put in uh, If you put in instead uh, gravitational waves from inflation, they boost the left side here. And since we have this anomaly now where there's too little power measured on the left side, the data doesn't like at all the theories which put in more here. If you uh, change the equation of state of the dark energy to not be constant, that has yet another funny effect on things. Um, in addition, what you can do is you can look at uh, how changing these parameters affects other things, like the galaxy power spectrum. And uh, what's very l wonderful here is that the effects are very different. For example, the optical depth to reionization doesn't have any effect at all on galaxies. So if the neutrinos had a weak, kind of weak effect on the CMB, but they totally poison small-scale galaxy power, there's going to be a prop, short prop quiz after this where you're going to have to remember how every single parameter affected every single curve here. Just kidding. The key thing I want you to take away from this is it's obvious just from looking at these that, 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 that the physics gets pretty complicated. And that's awesome. Because if you just measure some very boring curve, it's pretty clear that you can never extract more than one or two parameters from it, right? But if there's a super complicated curve and you can measure it really well, there's hope that you can learn a lot from it. And all of these different parameters affect the totality of these curves, unpolarized CMB, power, polarized galaxies, all in, in sufficiently different ways that when we have accurate measurements of everything, we can actually back out accurate measurements of all of these, these parameters. And that's been the, the, the really big success story of cosmology in the last decade. So let's talk a little bit more about the, these other tools that we have. I, I told you about uh, the Cosmic Micro background and try to give you just a little bit of a flavor of, of um, why there are fluctuations, why you have wiggles, what the scale of the wiggles are. Let's, yeah? H. Ah, there's a little H here. Thank you for asking. We, we, and we, we uh, introduced a lot of other pr parameters in cosmology, which are not independent ones, but are just shorthand ones, which are convenient. H is, is one, one of them. Actually, let me... Little h is just defined to be the big H, taking out all the dumb units. Because you divide it by 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec, where megaparsec is about 3 million light years. And we have measured this to be equal to about 0 0.7. Okay? And it turns out that that is more, the H inverse megaparsec is more linked to what you actually measure always in the sky. Now we kind of know what H is, but for a long time people were arguing about whether this was 0 0.5 or 1, and it was more convenient to bake it into the, to the units. You also saw many times in those movies, lowercase omega parameters. So for, for example, when it said lowercase omega b, that was just defined to be, I think I actually am to blame for introducing that notation <laughs> cosmology, because it, it's, it's h squared times the big omega. Because from the Friedman equation, it, it turns out that this is the thing which is just proportional to the physical density in, in kilograms per cubic meter. And that's the thing which usually matters more for the physics. 
So we, there are a lot of uh, little parameters. I actually have, I actually brought with me, a, if anyone wants it, a, a little handout where I took uh, all of these different cosmological parameters and put them all on one table with all their definitions. So this is Max's can, little cookbook with uh, his top 100 most useful cosmology equations. <laughs> The, uh, if anyone else is interested in this, um, I have some more, or we can make copies, or I can email it. So, so we've talked about three of these cosmological probes so far, but if you look at the picture, see there's some more. I want to so let's during the final minutes here talk a little bit more about the others. Lyman Alpha Forest. What's that? Whatever it is, it's clearly a technique that's useful for measuring the power spectrum on, on smaller scales, right? Well, the idea is very simple. If this is you and your telescope, and you look at a distant quasar at redshift 3, for example, you are looking through a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of hydrogen gas, which will cause a bunch of absorption in the, in the spectrum of the hydrogen. And uh, by looking very carefully at this absorption spectrum, you can learn very much about this stuff, how much there is at different distances, and turn that into this kind of measurements, okay? which agree very well, again, with the other ones we have here. Another technique, which is also very powerful, is gravitational lensing. So if you look, if you look at um, a picture like this, and you turn out the lights so you can look at it really, really carefully, you say, ah, just a bunch of galaxies. Oh, this must be a cluster of galaxies, a lot of stuff together. Then you look a bit more closely and you say, wait a minute. This is kind of weird. It's such a beautiful picture. I want to get all the lights out. Can someone see anything weird? What is this? What is this giant arc? What's happening here? is that the massive gravity from all the dark matter in the, around this galaxy cluster is bending the starlight from distant galaxies so much that they get co totally bent out of shape. It's much like when you look at yourself in the funny mirror in the amusement park and your face gets this totally distorted. Okay? So by looking at the, 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 this thing, this whole arc is actually just one galaxy whose image has been very stretched out. It's called strong gravitational lensing. By studying that, you can infer a bunch of stuff about the distribution of matter, even though the matter is dark and invisible. That's strong lensing. But the weak lensing is just that effect less to the extreme. If you look farther out here, the galaxies out here aren't generally warped out into such crazy arc shape, but they're all a little bit too elliptical, and they tend to be stretched in the, not in the radial, but in the tangential direction a little bit. Okay? And if you go and look to some random place in the sky, what you actually see is kind of like this. I put some of the pioneers of weak lensing here to illustrate. Things look a little bit too elliptical and in a correlated way. Okay? They look more, less round than they're supposed to be in a correlated way. If you see this kind of correlation of ellipticities of galaxies, it shouldn't be there at all because you know, this galaxy might be a billion light years behind this one. They're not near each other in space. They should have nothing to do with each other. Yet, if, if you see their ellipticity correlated, it's probably because there is a bunch of dark matter in the foreground which is warping both images the same way. Okay? And by studying these kind of ellipticity correlations, you can also make a beautiful measurement of the power spectrum of, of, this, of the matter which is doing this. What's very cool about this technique, is, and very com make, which makes it very complementary just using galaxies and Lyman Alpha Forest, is this will measure the power spectrum of all matter even if you can't see it, right? Because it's a purely gravitational probe, which is really wonderful. And um, it's very sensitive to these intermediate scales, but this field is aiming to do much larger scales by larger surveys, and there's a lot of potential here. So in summary, from 14 years ago, when things, the whole, the to sum total knowledge of the power spectrum was this pathetic, we've come a long way. We now have five different techniques for measuring this curve. They agree really, really well, and it just keeps getting better. Okay? And uh, that's very, very exciting. And what I would like to 
what I would like to do is just finish by, by uh, saying a few words about um, how I about the, the relationship between particle physics and cosmology and where I, I as we go forward and then I'll end, try to end a little bit early so you can ask me a few more questions here. So when I, when I started doing um, actually I know what I want to tell you about in five more minutes. I want to tell you about my day job. I want to tell you just a little bit about my single favorite technique. It wasn't on this slide. So right now, so when I was a grad student, right, we had, we had uh, a lot of discussions about, oh, it's going to be so cool in the future. We're going to get all this great data. And then we're going to measure these cosmological parameters. Well, now <laughs> we have done that to a reasonable extent. But there's still a huge amount of work to do because be behind each parameter we've measured is an unanswered question. You know, we know the density of dark matter, but hey, what is it? We know the density of dark energy, but what is it? Uh, we've measured these 10 to the minus 5 almost scale invariant fluctuations, but hey, what was it really that caused them? And more, uh, we have the density of atoms, but hey, what, how did diagenesis really work? So each parameter, we've really succeeded wonderfully in cosmology in parameterizing our ignorance, is what we've succeeded in. And it's a good start, but I think as, as we go forward, the most exciting thing is not to measure these same parameters to one more decimal place, it's to use all the new great data that's coming to test rather than to test these assumptions and try to go after the underlying physics, okay? And if you want to know the answer to these questions, the nature of dark matter, dark energy, or the early universe, then what kind of measurements should you make? Well, interestingly, the answer is the same for all of those three. You want to basically map our universe. What do I mean by that? I mean we want to map our universe better in three dimensions. Because let's remind ourselves of how little we've accomplished. We've mapped the outside surface of our observable universe, awesomely now with Planck. And we mapped the puny, puny little piece in the center here with these massive 3D galaxy surveys. And then we have a few scattered quasars and stuff a little bit higher redshift. The vast majority of this space not chartered at all, okay? In particular, back here above redshift of seven or so, we have seen almost no galaxies at all, and there were no galaxies at all, probably beyond redshift of 15, 20. So we can't even use these techniques. Huh? Well, um, Depends a bit on, on how, how bright things there are there to see, but I mean, if there are, we might be lucky and, and see a few things out there at HF20, but we're never, probably not going to be able to survey the whole sky and, and do these sort of massive 3D mapping projects with it. It'll be wonderful. I'm all for it. But there is a different technique. There is a different technique which has the potential of mapping actually more than half of all this volume, which is called 21 centimeter tomography. I want to just tell you a little bit about that. The idea is that this space in here, which just looks black, is all, high, especially in higher redshift, it's all this neutral hydrogen out there. And neutral hydrogen gives off radio waves. There's 21 centimeters long when they are emitted. It's the hyperfine transition. Every time the proton and the electron split, split the relative spin, off goes this long radio wave, right? And uh, if we can map that emission, we can make a 3D map of our universe throughout this, this volume because these, because by measuring the redshift of these 21 centimeter waves, we know how far they came from. This is, why hasn't anyone succeeded to do this yet? Because it's hard, the signals are very faint. But there's a huge race now, a lot of teams around the world are, are, are racing to try to do it because there's a huge science bounty to be had there. First of all, if you get a hundred times more volume mapped, you know, a hundred times more information, you should be able to cut your error bars at least by a square root of a hundred, ten or so, which is, would be huge. And second, you're probing uncharted territory in the history of our universe, which is super exciting. If you have a particle physics theory where there's some de decaying particle that decays on a time scale of a billion years or whatever, it's wonderful if you can map the universe around that time. And third, 
a basic impediment to measure the power spectrum on small scales is that things go nonlinear there. And perturbation theory breaks down, and we don't trust our calculations so much. So if, but if I flip this around, so, so large scales around this side, with this technique, you can go to much smaller scales and measure. Because if you look at regs of 20 at the universe, things are still beautifully linear and simple. You can map all these small scales too. So a lot of teams are racing to try to do this first, going by names as GMRT, a Chinese experiment called PAST, uh, LOFAR in, in, in Europe, the MWA project, which is I'm involved with, which is called collaboration between Harvard, MIT, and, and various Australian universities. Um, the paper t experiment led out of Berkeley, and the various upstarts doing cool stuff. And I want to just tell you during two minutes about the Omniscope project, which is something we're doing out of my lab at MIT, where, which is a developing a technology for doing all this vastly cheaper. If you take a traditional radio telescope like the one on the left, and you try to scale it up, you know, what, what do you actually need to detect a very faint signal? You need a very big telescope. What do you need to have a very big telescope? A very big budget. But how big? If you're going to build this, scale this thing up to a square kilometer and have it be able to move and point, just forget it. Forget it. So instead, what, what the teams are doing is they're going all digital with video telescopes. You build a vast number of cheap, small antennas and then measure the voltage in all of them and feed all that into a computer and have it figure out what the sky looks like. So you're leveraging off of all the progress in the semiconductor industry, basically, to eliminate all moving parts. Problem with this is the cost of this goes like the number of antennas squared, the way everybody else is doing it, because you have to correlate every pair of antennas. So we have a different approach where we, for reasons I won't bore you with unless you ask me afterwards, cut the, we, we, with our architecture the cost goes only like n log n. So if you make it a million times bigger, instead of it costing 10 to the 12 times more, it costs 10 to the 6 times more. You can, you can just, just scale very nicely. And, uh, and we got funding to build a prototype. I won't bore you with the details. I just want to tell you that I've been having a lot of fun with this because I have, have these super friendly students who are just really a treat to work with. You can see that they have a good sense of humor. Here we are during one of our recent expeditions. And we, we go up to have, to, we have to get away from human sources of radio waves because we're maybe looking for these very faint radio waves from Maine. And the most radio quiet place in the eastern half of the U.S. turns out to be in this val beautiful valley in northwestern Maine near the Canadian border where the, the mountains block out Canadian radio stations and stuff. And so we, we load all our gear into this van, drive up for four hours, work really hard, set up our whole radio telescope. And then the next day, half of the team goes whitewater rafting because there, is, there, is the four, there are two different class four rivers there. It's awesome. And then those who survive the whitewater rafting come back and take data the next day while the rest of us go rafting. And then we take data. And it's, 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 it's just really, really super fun. And I think uh, the fact that it's super fun is actually a great uh, note on when it's to end all my lectures because I, I um, think that is precisely the way I feel also about all of cosmology. Because if, if, if it turns out that you can pull off something like this, even if you can only map out the dark blue region of our universe here really, really accurately, for instance, you can take the measurement of, of the curvature of space, where well, now with Planck, we, we can do it at a little bit better than 1%, and you can do almost 100 times better. You can get down to the tenth, almost the 10th minus 4 level. You can measure inflation so accurately that you can, you can even detect the so-called running of the spectral index at, at many sigma. If you're neutrino buff, you can measure with this the absolute mass of the most massive neutrino to 0 0.007 EV, and you get it, be guaranteed to detect something because we know there's something there from atmospheric, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think this is a really fun technique. No guarantee it'll work, but I think it has great potential. And, and um, I think there's a lot of cool things to look forward to in cosmology and in the interface in particular between cosmology and particle physics. So thank you so much.
Uh,